Good afternoon, everyone. I um, want to thank you for coming out. Um, I know you're probably still in a lunch coma, and but the, the real reason is you're trying to save the best for last on the last day, right? No, you're just waiting your turn for the puppies downstairs, aren't you? <laughs> All right. Um, so like I said, uh, where is it? There we are. My name is Joseph Jenkins. I work for the NC State University Libraries. I'm the Senior Systems Programmer Analyst for the IT department there. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, how we've started the move from this, uh, the old ways of doing uh, IT and uh, monolithic imaging and pushing out uh, all the software automatically and configuring devices and stepping towards a self-service first mentality. Um, quick show of hands, though, uh, how many of you already use uh, self-service as a self-service first mentality? Okay, a few of you, good, good. All right, so my agenda is going to be, the first half of this is going to be a little bit of our philosophical approach of how we've uh, started to move towards self-service. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how we've moved that with our custom trigger policy deployment and tied that into our self-service uh, model. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we're using that to empower others and stepping back because we all know that we in IT love to give away power and step back and let other people do things for us, right? In the beginning, there was darkness. This is my inspirational quote from the days before Jamf and self-service. IT is easy. Anyone can do IT. It's like riding a bike, except the bike's on fire. You're on fire. Everything's on fire, and you're in hell. <laughs> this is pretty much how our environment worked before we moved into Jamf and self-service. A user submits a software request. IT packages up the software, figures out how the software works. IT dispatches a technician to install, or we push the install through something like Apple Remote Desktop. The result of this was escalations, competing priorities, and users complaining about who was going to be first to get what when. Um, that was just not a sustainable model for us, especially since we only had one systems administrator. So we started to look at uh, self-service, and once we moved into the JSS, oops, wrong button. The overview of how we currently use uh, self-service is we deploy software, we deploy software updates with self-service, we update our inventory with self-service, and we deploy common issue fixes. It's a pretty standard fare, but um, when we started moving towards um, a self-service first mentality, we had to deal with the doubters. Uh, that's the most PC way that I can put it. And when we were moving towards self-service, we have four uh, most common threads. Uh, looking at this, uh, how many of you have heard some variation of these four before? Yeah. Software has to be pre-installed because reasons. No particular reason, just because reasons. Um, software takes too long to install. There will be confusion if the software is not installed. And if the install fails, then the users don't have the software that they need. Right, okay, I got, I got that. Um, there are some of these that are pretty valid. What I had to do was change the way that we were talking about self-service and how we were going to deploy software to make the environment that we wanted. And I had to change how we were talking about it in a way that we were going to empower our users to create the environment that they want rather than providing them the things that we think that they need. Most of the times when you uh, follow the old adage of if you build it, they will come, well, if you deploy it, they will think they need it. Um, when, it's, when we started talking about larger installs, well, since we work in an education environment, uh, we support about 30,000 uh, plus students on campus as well as around 2,000 faculty. 
and that's not necessarily those that work within the library, but just anyone who comes into the library expects to have their software available to them as it appears in their college or department. So we have to work with those faculty staff and we take input from students in order to figure out the types of software that they're going to need. There was no way that we were going to be able to deploy every piece of software on campus uh, to every device that we support. It was just not feasible. But we had to figure out what the largest install base was and then we had to automate that much so that we could ensure that uh, we wouldn't have long install times from self-service. Because if they're sitting there with a long install time on self-service, then they're, they're saying then self-service doesn't work. And that led to changing the narrative. We're not taking away software. All software is available, but it's just in self-service. And then if the install fails, then it's obviously not past QA. We didn't catch something in testing. So if the package fails from self-service, we're pretty sure that it's going to fail if it were in an automated method as well. So we need to know about that one way or the other. And when I was talking to uh, the administrators about that, um, that was, they kind of responded with those four and said, okay, yeah, that's, that's all great and wonderful, but what's, what's the real catch of this? What are we going to do? What's, what's the thing that's going to make us, you know, back you on this self-service first mentality? Since working in education, we know that money. By having a smaller install base, that means I can buy smaller hard drives, which means that I'm spending less money on hardware, which means that we can buy a greater quantity of uh, certain types of hardware with smaller hard drives. And then we're allowing our patrons to be able to install that software when they want it rather than having it available all the time. Okay. So a uh, show of hands, was, was there anyone here at uh, JNUC last year that attended my custom trigger policy session? One. Hey, Vince. <laughs> uh, so the library uses custom trigger policies. Is anyone familiar with custom trigger policies? Anyone using custom trigger policies in your environment? Okay. We, we have our custom trigger policy uh, environment set up to install and configure our environment. We have a single enrollment policy uh, configured that will check the type of the device that's enrolling and then that enrollment policy will run a script to determine what software stack or configuration is going to be installed in our environment. When I was looking at uh, moving towards a self-service first mentality and integrating that with my already developed custom trigger environment, I needed a method of the install that would work for terminal, pre-stage enrollment, and self-service without creating multiple policies for the same package. I didn't want to have a package that would run for self-service. I didn't want to have a package that would run for uh, automated enrollment. I didn't want to have to call another installer from Terminal. I just wanted uh, all of these things to point to the same installer. I also needed the ability to scope installs for different licenses applying to different types of users. Um, in my environment, we have different licenses for faculty and staff versus uh, students or anyone else who is not working at the library. We just call them patrons. And I needed a single self-service policy that would serve all users and use uh, script logic to determine the license type. Um, just a random, uh, random question here. Uh, what do you think is the most difficult set of software in your environment to license right now? Adobe? Well, I came up with this uh, multiple license example uh, that I wanted to show how we made that happen. Um, you may have heard of uh, this company. <laughs> um, we love our friends at Adobe. Adobe, much love to you. And uh, in self-service, I have all of my Adobe applications broken down. And then I have uh, this policy that's highlighted right here, um, install Creative Cloud. This policy will call a uh, custom trigger policy from self-service, and it will have some script logic behind that to determine 
all of the uh, software installs, and then it will determine the license file. Here's the, what that looks like in my JSS. You'll notice that it's just two shell scripts, or uh, one shell script and one uh, custom trigger policy. Uh, the self-service policy runs a units command from files and processes and commands. Jamf policy, I need to change that to event, not trigger. Uh, install Creative Cloud. And then above that is the custom trigger policy that says install Creative Cloud. And that runs a script to install all of the applications. And then here at the very bottom, you'll notice where it looks at the host name of the computer. Our host names of our devices determine what actions we're going to take on those computers. So if it is any type of staff device, we have to run a notification that says uh, you're going to use a named user license. Otherwise, we have to install our shared device license. Now, the shared device license is its own policy and package that uh, installs itself. Looks really simple up there. Took a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and whiskey to get to that point. So other thing that we uh, do with our software is we do a little bit more with, uh, with self-service than just deploy software. Um, we can update the location. We can uh, erase and reconfigure the computer. Some other things that we do is uh, submit an IT support request, and that just sends an email out to our service desk. And then we do um, user folder cleanup if we're ever having problems with uh, keychains, because that never happens. <coughs> and go. Uh, first uh, example I'm going to go through is update location. The location update is a part of a device deployment for all of our users. As soon as I have a technician that sets the computer down, uh, what they're going to do is to run update location, and it's going to prompt uh, the technician or the user that's running it for the building room and the owner ID of the computer. That information is then collected via a custom JAMF recon command that uses a couple of uh, dash commands and then sends that up to the computer object inside of the JSS. What's advantageous about that is if I'm just telling it to update those things, it doesn't do a full recon. And if you've ever run a full recon on your devices, that can really fill up some, uh, some space and take a little bit of time with, the, with your JSS. Here is a quick uh, screen capture of how that works. It's the update computer location. What's happening right now is it's calling that uh, custom trigger policy. And it's, uh, that custom trigger policy sees that it has a script to run. It's going to eventually prompt me for the building that this device sits in. So I select my building, the DHL Junior Library. It prompts me for the room number. I'm in room 2109, and I am desk IT11. And the owner of this device just happens to be me. Now it's updating all of that into the JSS uh, device record. And that's what it looks like once it's finished. The username is captured, which is me, and the room uh, condenses that uh, building name down to a three-letter abbreviation and the room number that uh, I updated. What that policy does is it runs a script, and it uses an Apple script prompt. And that's called from the OA script command in a shell script. And there's the command that I use for jamf recon. So it just prompts those two things for me. It gives me the room number, and it gives me the end username which is the owner ID. I also have the full script available here, and I've got that also available at the end. The next thing that I want to do uh, whenever I have a, uh, a student that's sitting down or a student technician that's working for me, and they've tried all that they can to figure this out, and as soon as I give them a, a nice friendly phase, I will tell them, all right, we don't know what's going on, nuke and pave. 
And all that really does is it's going to wipe the computer and re-enroll it back into the JSS. This is what it looks like. Again, it's uh, very uh, friendly and calming. There's nothing like a nice mushroom cloud to let you know that you're, you're safe and you're fine. And when they click on that, this is what it's running. Jamf policy event nuke and ampersand. If you're not familiar with why I have the ampersand there, um, long story short, what that does is it allows a self-service policy to execute and then exit cleanly. Here's the script that I use for that. I'm able to reuse this script for multiple versions of Mac OS because I've defined the installer app path and the installer app path version as parameters four and five. If you've ever used uh, the scripting interface in a policy, you'll have uh, the parameters that you can define and the uh, parameter four and parameter five, what I do is I put the application path for say install Mac OS Mojave and then I define the application version that I want to make sure that it has. What this script then does is it sees if the, uh, the OS installer is installed in the applications folder. If it is not, then call the cache policy to cache the installer. If it is installed, then check the version of the application installer and see if it's the latest one that I'm supporting. If not, then remove it and download the latest version. After that, it runs the uh, erase install Mac OS command for me, wipes the computer, and then we're off to the races. And there's the parameter four and parameter five values that I was talking about. I list the path to the installer and then the version of the application that I want it to have. And then that uh, nuke custom trigger, this is what that looks like. It's just an execute command inside of files and processes. And that's the start OS install, erase install. It names the uh, volume Macintosh HD. If uh, we don't define that, then oftentimes you'll find you'll come back with your Macintosh HD renamed untitled, and that just causes some confusion among some of our scripts. Um, two other important triggers to note is the agree to license, so it agrees to everything. So you, the user isn't prompted to agree to anything, and then it calls the no interaction trigger. Which brings us to the really hardest part. Not only do we have to change the way that my administration is thinking, I also have to change the way that I'm thinking about my approach to information technology. And cultural challenges we are overcoming by embracing a self-service first mentality. Before we moved to this, we had very much on-site response. It was uh, within an hour response. We had to respond to every request, no matter what that was. And uh, that was really hurting our uh, return on uh, what we were able to do for project work, um, infrastructure development. And so we changed our on-site response, giving way to service deliverables, which is basically our way of saying it's in self-service. The second thing that I faced was uh, user education. When your users are used to um, that immediate response and someone coming to help them, it has been a bit of a challenge for me to say it really is okay to click install. I promise you that uh, as long as you are looking at what you're installing, it is okay to click that install button. And then the last two is really for me and our approach to uh, IT. The dark lord of IT is no more. Again, we really love to give away power in IT. Am I right? Yeah. We're all nodding. We're all in agreement. Um, it is our job to make our job obsolete. And the first time that I said that, I got a lot of dumbfounded looks from the rest of the staff. It's not that we're trying to put ourselves out of work, it's that we're trying to make things easier for our users so that we can do the other things that we've been neglecting while we've been on this immediate response trajectory that has spiraled us down into issues with escalating priorities. And then the last thing um, is let it go. What I mean by let it go is 
no matter what solution you develop, no matter how much automation you introduce, there are always going to be issues. Uh, there are always going to be problems. You know, the network could have a hiccup. Um, you may forget that um, the JSS was going to be down for an upgrade and you told users to install something. I've never personally done that. No, I've totally done that more than once. <laughs> and um, we also have to understand that it's going to take time for people to accept this change, to move forward with us. Uh, it doesn't matter how good the solution is, you're going to have to work with your users and understand that sometimes it just takes a little while for them to follow along with you. All right, um, these are the links of interest. I included a, a shameless plug to my JNUC 2018 presentation uh, that talks about our custom trigger policy. And then I've also included the link to the Jamf Nation discussion article that lists all of the scripts that I'm using for custom trigger policies as well as uh, the self-service stuff that I presented today. Everybody got it? Okay, with that, questions? Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing all of this. Wonderful. Of course. Um, can you tell us about a time when this didn't work, when uh, maybe something blew up or a horror story uh, where you tried to empower the user and it just blew up in your face? I'm sorry, it I must caught, be one. It I must caught be part one. of that. Um, can you tell us about a time when, uh, when trying to empower the user did not work? Trying to empower the user yeah. when it didn't happen? Yeah, when it blew up in your face. Blew up in my face. Um, yes, actually. Um, I had one where I was trying to get my uh, IT director to upgrade to um, High Sierra at the time, and uh, I proudly declared that it's in self-service go out and uh, upgrade your Mac. Well, at the same time that she did that, I had forgotten one of those times when the JSS was going to be down for uh, an update, and she happily clicked her uh, self-service policy, and it got halfway through uh, executing the policy before the, the JSS went down, and then the installer was midway in a, in a download, and it went ahead and executed the command to upgrade. That was not a good day for me. I'm sort of chatting with people back at home while you're talking, and somebody asked the question, what if somebody picks a department that maybe, say, they're not actually supposed to be in? Like, obviously, we could rescope it after the fact, but is, do you prevent that? Do you care? I mean, philosophy-wise, philosophy how do you deal with that? Um, if someone ex comes Like if they're setting up the computer with self-service, as your earlier example. If I'm setting up a computer and I'm... Yeah, so like they, they enroll it, they, uh, uh -huh. you, they log in, self-service is there, they can choose their department and the software they want. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say they pick software or they pick a department that they're not actually in. Do you care? Do you deal with that? Um, since we support uh, all software supported by departments, uh, we don't really care if anyone installs a piece of software not in their department. We just make it uh, available and if it has a license attached to it, specifically a seat license, then we usually have that available only on devices where it's supposed to be licensed. So anyone from a department could come in and install it only on that device. Uh, I was just curious if you have uh, Windows in your environment as well, and. Um, how do you make sure both, because self-service works great for Mac, obviously, but then we're still having to go visit people at their desks when they're using Windows. Uh, how do you um, ensure that both, and mm -hmm. if anyone else has this <laughs> to you? Okay. Um, wasn't prepared to field Windows questions, but Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's a problem. <laughs> Uh, no, no problem whatsoever. Uh, we, we do have a, a self-service option available for our Windows folks. 
Um, we have uh, SCCM for campus, and we do um, the software center for that. Uh, we're also uh, playing around with uh, a couple of other options. Uh, if you've not heard of uh, Chocolatey, um, that's something that we've been um, heavily investigating. Uh, it's a uh, PowerShell-based uh, delivery system off of uh, Microsoft's NuGet technology. I think you got one behind you. Do you do any uh, tracking or reporting for usage of self-service to see how often it's being used? Do I do any tracking on clicks or whatever? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, we, we haven't done anything official with that, but um, we do occasionally take a look at our um, policy logs to see how many times something is being clicked uh, specifically in self-service versus uh, automated deployment or whatever. Okay, any other questions? Nope. All right, well, that'll wrap it up. Thank you very much, Joseph. You got one right there. Perhaps I missed it, but uh, in your screenshots, um, do you use the messaging feature built into self-service and Jamf where, to alert your users like, hey, there's an update or, um, or you need to do this or X, Y, or Z? Oh, uh, yeah, we will use uh, some of the uh, user notification and policies to let them know when a policy is running. Um, that way, uh, we'll uh, often use uh, policy as executing, and then when the policy is complete, we have another notification that runs after the policy has completed. Anyone else? Going once? Oh, the links? Sure. All right, if there's no other questions. Like I said, thank you very much, Joseph. And he'll be around for questions if you do want to uh, entertain that. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and uh, we have another session in here. Uh, for the last session of the day before we get to the uh, happy hour. So thank you very much, and thank you, Joseph. Thank you all.